there was someone who came up to me and I think out of, you know, for lack of better words, or just trying to relate, he, he actually called me a war baby. And I, I had a strong reaction to it because I just wanted to, I'm now crying. Um, but I do feel different because my parents were married and they were married a long time before they had kids. They were in college. So it wasn't, there was nothing negative about their story, but I feel like that term has a lot of heaviness to it. If you were to define love child, I would think this is a, the, the, either the child of some very passionate, maybe illegitimate affair or something like that. Or it could mean a child that, you know, was uh, the, the, the ultimate product of, you know, of, of, of love. I can't imagine what my parents had to endure as an interracial couple in the 50s. For them to be able to create a, a nurturing environment where they could raise their children, you know, really create a sort of love bubble in a sense, really illustrates that, that those terms of, of uh, poor baby love child. Some of my cousins have very dark skin, and so the way I'm treated or um, understood in relationship to the whole context of, of place and who I am is completely different depending on who I am around at the time. So on my uh, marriage license, it says like a, a white bride married to, and it's just literally O-T-H-A and then S-N because they couldn't fit other Asian, so it's like other Asian. I, I almost assumed that we were kind of past that point. Uh, but when I was adopted in the 1980s, um, of course, Korea was no longer a war-torn country, but I think this whole legacy of war in many uh, respects uh, persisted in the public imaginary of South Korea. A lot of my peers that I grew up with may, may be hapa by Asian moms with military dads, but my parents didn't actually meet in the war. They didn't meet in you know, Vietnam or China or Japan. They met at USC when he was her TA. I guess they had some trouble with her name, Toshko, and they were started to say, well, we'll just call you Teresa. And my dad, who was not participating in the conversation, came in and said, that's not her name. Her name is Toshi. And, uh, and I think they just kept trying to call her Teresa. And he got very upset and, and asked them to leave the house. And that's what my father did when he returned to the United States. He said that he would stand on Moon Lake or on the shore of Moon Lake or walk to the Mississippi and recite the alphabet, the English alphabet out loud with pebbles in his mouth. And so, and to me, that was like a form of, you know, this sort of real uh, violent form, in a sense, that's internal, of grinding away your ethnicity, of grinding away your identity, of grinding away who you were by using stones, almost like you're milling your mouth. So there are some of the artists in the book that do directly talk about their mixed race identity. Others, it's something that's in the background, not, not so much in the forefront. And so there's a variety of ways that, that people express that. I think it's necessary to explore the visual images of mixed heritage and mixed race Asian Americans because our visual images are so misinterpreted by other people. So I think that's one of the reasons that I would suspect that that's one of the reasons that so many of the artists that we interviewed, almost all of them, really created some kind of self-portrait in their work. And that might have been a literal self-portrait or a figurative self-portrait. But at some level, almost all of the work refers to the self of the artist in a really interesting way.